considering our current worldwide circumstances, you'd think Jehovah's Witnesses wouldn't knock on your door. They've even told their members to default to other forms of witnessing, like writing letters to people or social media witnessing. But somebody recently told me they had some witnesses knock on their door the other day, even during a worldwide pandemic. What are they thinking? They must not have gotten the memo. Either way, I find it really fascinating that they find alternatives when they view the reason not to congregate as legitimate. Like the virus situation. Jehovah's Witnesses started using Zoom to hold their church service. Solid plan. They're doing the right thing there. But why didn't they do that when they got banned in Russia? The governing body members told their members in Russia to continue meeting covertly, despite the fact that Russia seriously mistreated these people. Why? Why didn't they find another solution like they have in this situation? They could have saved lives. I can't imagine what explanation they have for it besides the fact that they absolutely love to be persecuted. They view it as a badge of honor. They're about to be in real bad shape anyways. One of the cures being used for this illness is basically a blood transfusion from somebody who's recovered from it already. Because people who recovered have the antibodies. If you infuse somebody with blood containing antibodies, it helps them fight it off faster. If that's the ultimate solution, which who knows if it actually will be or not, but if it is, it'll mean the deaths of Jehovah's Witnesses. I really don't want to see any harm come to them. I was a kid knocking on doors once too. As they say, there but by the grace of God go I. I'm lucky I didn't get in a serious car accident when I was little. Lucky I didn't actually need a blood transfusion, because I'd be dead right now if I had. So I want to see as many Jehovah's Witnesses make it safely out the other side as possible. And I fear that it's coming to a point where lots of them are going to be faced with a tough decision. Sacrifice themselves to the governing body, or to Jehovah as they view it. Something that God only asked for three times in the Bible. Isaac, Jephthah, and Jesus. And something that he actually followed through on in only two cases, something he never demanded of the typical follower. So by declining the life-saving blood transfusion, they aren't really sacrificing themselves to God. They're sacrificing themselves to men. I hope any Jehovah's Witnesses giving this a listen take the time to mull that over. The point I'm trying to make here is that you should be putting up signs to prevent Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons from knocking on your door, because Jehovah's Witnesses have the potential to be more fucked by this situation than any of us. Even if you don't get a sign from me, I want to start a campaign where people put signs outside their doors that'll deter Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons. Put something up that tells them to go away. You're in social isolation. Tell them you think you might have the virus and you don't want to infect them. That's how we're all supposed to be acting anyways. As though we have it and we don't want to spread it. If you want to get a sign from my store that conveys the message, I still have them for sale. But as I said, even if it isn't one of mine, you should put something outside your door anyways. If you want one of the signs, then click the link in the description in the pinned comment and it'll take you to my Etsy store where you can get one. You can also reach it by going to telltaleatheist.com slash 3D store. I have some other stuff on there too, like mugs and stickers and stuff, so give it a look. Anyways, with all that being said, let's get into this Caleb and Sophia video. I've done every single Caleb and Sophia video so far. This is next in the list. Let's give it a watch. comments today, both of you. So mom, will we go to the park? Hmm, I think so. Yes. Yes. You might have missed it at first glance, but give this part a listen one more time. Nice comments today. And then they say this. Will we? Go to the park? This is the religion subtly setting up a system of rewards and punishments, which, for those of you who watch my channel on the reg, already know why that's important. When assessing whether or not something is a cult, I use a model called the BITE model, written by Stephen Hassan. BITE is an acronym that stands for Behavior Control, Information Control, Thought Control, and Emotion Control. It's the four ways cults control people to keep them subjugated. And the point that I consider to be the most important on the BITE model, or at least under the Behavior Control, category is modifying behavior with a system of rewards and punishments. Like the famous scientist Pavlov, he basically programmed his dog to salivate at the sound of a bell ringing. Jehovah's Witnesses and cults more broadly program behavior into their members with a system of rules and rewards and punishments for breaking those rules. So the next logical question is, doesn't a family set up rewards and punishments by default anyways? Why would this be an example of a cult programming people? To answer that, we need to look at the influence continuum. Yes, families 
enemies do have rules with rewards and punishments for breaking those rules. But what are those rules intended to do? Here's a picture of the influence continuum. This was written by Stephen Hassan too. We're constantly influenced by different groups and people around us. The question is, what's the intention behind that influence? Is the influence based on the person's own conscience or is it built on group doctrine? Is it intended to make the person more dependent and obedient or does it encourage free will and critical thinking? Does it encourage creativity and humor or is it built on fear and guilt? Is there unconditional love or is the love conditional? If the kids here broke a rule, what would the ultimate consequences be? Are the consequences set by the parents or an outside organization? In this case, the parents are influencing the kids to get them more involved in an organization that'll make them more dependent on and obedient to the organization itself. So this might seem innocuous, but this system of rewards and punishments that the mom is enforcing right now will be with the kids for the rest of their lives and isn't encouraging the kids' free will, critical thinking, creativity, or humor. It's making them more dependent on the organization. That's it. Let's continue. Oh, okay. We just have to wait a bit for dad and see what he says. Here comes dad. Oh, it looks like somebody needs a ride. <clears throat> Thank you so much. I hope this doesn't spoil your plans. What a beautiful afternoon. <clears throat> All right. We're going to take Wilfredo home and help him with a few things, okay? So Caleb and Sophia had plans to go to the park as a reward for involving themselves deeper with the organization. And that plan was deflated when they found out they had to help an older person in the congregation. This is actually something Jehovah's Witnesses push pretty hard. It's something I've talked about before too. I said I'd go into more detail at some point on this subject, so I'll just tell the story now. When I was eight, my dad got in a car accident. It was bad enough that his back was completely wrecked from it. He was in a wheelchair from that point on. My family and I put ourselves out for him. From a very young age, I'd have to push him around the store, bring him food and water, basically wait on him hand and foot for my entire life. Years later, when I was about 19, he stood up out of the wheelchair and walked into the living room and said, I've been lying to you guys and myself for 11 years. I can really walk. Of course, we already knew that. We knew he could walk from the wheelchair to the toilet, for example, or from the bed to the wheelchair, but he said he couldn't do much more than that. It was a back pain problem, not a paralysis problem. But we'd walk in the house sometimes and see him standing, bending over to pick up the cat. No wheelchair in sight. Suddenly he'd start whining and crying about how much his back hurt. Or I'd be in the basement and I'd hear him zip from the bedroom to the kitchen, and then back from the kitchen to the bedroom. It wasn't really a surprise to any of us, but he used his handicap as a cover for over a decade anytime somebody would blame him for something. Anytime he'd be called out by the elders or by the police for his bad behavior toward me or other family members. He'd say, how could I attack him? I'm in a wheelchair. He's making it up. You'd think I'd feel vindicated when he finally walked into the living room and told the truth for the first time in 11 years. But the feeling I had was disgust, not vindication. I haven't really talked to him since. Anyways, the point of the story is, since he was quote-unquote handicapped, he was on something called a visitation list. Jehovah's Witnesses in the congregation would come over and help him with stuff. They'd hang out and chat, spend time with him, study the Bible with him, whatever. Now, generally speaking, I think that's a good thing. You're only as strong as your weakest link. Setting up some system of community where the oldest and the weakest are taken care of is a good thing. But the reason they do that with older people is because Jehovah's Witnesses want to set up their own sub-government. They view it as a theocracy. They claim Jesus is the head of the government, but Jesus doesn't talk to anybody on earth except the governing body members. So they pass the secret messages down from Jesus to the rest of the membership. Really clever setup they've got going on there. Anyways, they want to make sure that when societal collapse actually happens, when Armageddon starts, as they expect it to any five minutes now, the organization can split up into fully autonomous cells that look out for each other and have a hierarchy that follows the orders of the higher-ups and looks out for others. If you guys think Jehovah's Witnesses are having a hard time with this current virus situation, you're wrong. They've been preparing for this for a hundred years. So as innocent as it seems to take care of older members, and as positive and helpful a message as this is, it gives us a glimpse into the goals, structure, and belief system of the organization. They want their members to be dependent on each 
each other and more broadly dependent on the organization so that if they stop believing or they break a rule or something they can yank the rug out from under you and toss you out in the cold like they did to me when I stopped believing it they leave you with nothing because your entire world is built up and supported by the organization and community when you leave they tell everybody you ever knew or loved not to talk to you anymore it's toxic and wrong, and I honestly couldn't possibly begin to understand how they can justify it to themselves. Okay, let's listen to their explanation for why Caleb is doing the right thing by foregoing his reward for giving up his independence to the organization. Caleb, you know, today you can make something Jesus made all the time. Make something? What? A sacrifice. How? Well, Jesus worked hard, and sometimes he had plans to rest. But when people needed his help, he made a sacrifice, Jesus, help us. giving up what he wanted to do to help someone else. Right! And how did that make him feel? Happy! Even if he didn't get to go to the park. Again, this is a good message generally. We should strive to look out for people around us. We're only as strong as our weakest link. I believe we should try to be selfless, but this is a glimpse into the Jehovah's Witnesses organization and mindset. They aren't exactly ordering people to do this kind of thing for selfless reasons. They're making their members more dependent on each other and on the organization. How does this guy get by without the people in the congregation? It keeps him in line, prevents him from asking risky questions. He knows his entire support network it's built on this organization, and if he criticizes it in any way, he loses everything. He loses everybody he ever knew. They'll never talk to him again. They'll never help him again. Asking questions isn't worth the risk. I know a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses who've told me they're only still in it because their entire lives are built around it, and they can't afford to lose their friends and family. That's how cults keep you subjugated. They punish you for dissenting. It's ugly and disgusting, and I want to see the mindset come to an end. Anyways, that's all I've got for you. Don't forget to check out my store and please make sure you put up a sign outside your door turning Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons away because they're still knocking on doors in some areas and the very last thing this group needs is to get sick from an illness that might or might not be cured through a blood transfusion. I don't want anybody to die, even Jehovah's Witnesses. I want them to find their way out of their religion just like I did. If you want one of my signs you can find a link to them in the description or the pinned comment. Okay, thanks for watching guys.